Let us pray together. Lord, we gather together today in the name of your Son. We thank you for the promise of his presence, that when two or three are gathered together in his name, he is here. So draw us to you. Open our hearts, our minds, to you. Help us to see you in our midst. Be aware of your presence. Draw us to you. Thank you that we are yours and that you love us dearly. Speak to us, Lord. Your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Today's Gospel reading is both disturbing as well as comforting, all at the same time. It really depends on where you are in terms of the spectrum of how you understand Jesus, what you think of him, how, if you do, how you relate to him. You see, what's going on here as we enter into this story, like a lot of the readings, we're kind of stepping into the middle of a conversation. Jesus has been teaching his disciples about how he is, as we said actually in the opening prayer, he is the good shepherd. And he talks about who's the good shepherd. He's the one who lays down his life for the sheep. He's the one who fights on their behalf when they get in trouble. He's the one, in other words, that they can count on. And he's saying something pretty startling because, as you well know, if you've ever had any dealing with sheep, they are utterly dependent on their shepherd for just about anything. They actually don't know how to think very well for themselves, which is why they need a shepherd to make sure they get to the right pastures and the right streams so that they can eat and drink. And they, but the wonder of it is, is that they do in fact develop an affinity for the voice of their shepherd. They recognize it. And therefore, when the shepherd calls, they know that's dinner. I've got to be there, and they go and they follow their shepherd. Now, in the midst of all of that conversation, Jesus is now walking along, as it says. It's at the Feast of Dedication, Solomon's Temple. John's trying to lay out a context. And so some of the Jewish leaders come up, and they say to him, and this is where we pick it up, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. But notice what Jesus responds. He said, I've told you. You don't believe, though. What's happening here? Jesus has said by his words, his teachings, the miracles, his acts of kindness and compassion, that he really is the Messiah, the long-awaited one who would deliver and set people free. But the Jewish leaders have a different picture. This isn't what they expected when they think of Messiah. They think of a military ruler who will come and overthrow the Romans. They think of someone who will come on a flashing horse, sword, military victory, liberate. The Good Shepherd is not that. Not now, anyway. And so, Jesus, their picture of who the Messiah is and who Jesus is are, you see, very, very different from one another. So they're, they're troubled. They're confused. They, they don't quite know what to do. And therefore, they look at him and they say, you are not what I think about. And actually, what I even understand some of the Hebrew scriptures to say about who it is that you really are. And yet, you do things that other rabbis don't do. So are, are you the Messiah or not? That's, in fact, the first challenge for us. A part of what happens is we read the Bible. What should, in fact, be challenged and called into question is our own concepts about God, who the Messiah is, who is Jesus. It's very easy, you see, for us to read back into the New Testament our own assumptions about who Jesus is. And... 
we have to sort of make the adjustment. What am I going to believe? Am I going to believe my assumptions? Or am I going to believe what the scripture teaches? Because they may not line up, you see, at all. Sometimes in small ways, sometimes actually in very large ways. I remember as a kid, there was a little children's chapel that I used to go to where we would have children's church. And in that little chapel, this was an older building, there was a, there was a, a stained glass window of Jesus as the Good Shepherd. So here you have this picture. Here is this Jesus. He's a lily white Anglo. He's certainly not a Middle Eastern Jew. <laughs> his robe is absolutely pristine white. He's got a sheep on his shoulders. The sheep is also pristine white. <laughs> There's not a smudge of dirt on him. And I would look at that, and I, I, I didn't know what to do with that as an 11-year-old who liked to play in the dirt. <laughs> And, and then when I actually began to little, learn a little bit about what the life of a shepherd was like, I thought, this is not that. <laughs> Shepherds get dirty. And it's actually a very tough and hard life. And yet, so how do I deal with this beatific vision of this very pristine Jesus holding this lily white sheep? Especially, see, since I was taught, rightly, that we're sheep. Well, just like... Normal sheep get dirty, we get dirty too, don't we? You know, we don't always lead a very clean life. So they, it raised questions for me. Do I qualify for being one of those sheep? Because I'm not like that. And worse, does Jesus understand about the real rough and tumble of existence? If who this picture is in the stained glass window, at least for me, had no connection to the reality of my life at all. You see, it was a relief when I actually began to read the Bible to see that who Jesus was was not like that window. Really not like that window at all. That he really knows the depths of Pain, life, sorrow, incongruity, tragedy, things that don't work out the way we expect it. It happened to him and it happened to his followers. And in the midst of all of that, Jesus was never afraid, never, to be absolutely with people in deep, deep trouble. I didn't have to be a clean lamb to qualify for Jesus, to be on Jesus' shoulders. He could receive, he would and could and did receive me just as I am. With all of my incongruities, with all of my difficulties, with all of my questions, with all of my faults. Because as the scripture says, speaking of God, he knows whereof we are made. He remembers that we are but dust. In other words, he deeply understands what it means to be human. And because he himself, because we believe he is the word made flesh, because he himself is and was human, he knows everything that we go through. And you see, it is both that identification as well as that experience and the very nature of who he is as the word became flesh and dwelt among us that enables him even now to be the good shepherd that we actually need. He understands what it is that we go through. He challenges us as one who understands what it means to be human. In other words, for Jesus to be the good shepherd doesn't always mean that he's nice. Sometimes he's actually more loving than being nice. Sometimes he fights on our behalf. Sometimes he fights against us when we go the wrong way. Because if he's going to lead us, as we read in Psalm 23, along right pathways for his name's sake, that means when we choose to take a wrong path, that means he goes, nope. This is not what I want for you. And challenges us to stay within the path that
that in fact he has set before us. In other words, to see Jesus is the good shepherd is not beatific passivity, but instead one who understands everything that we go through and who is actively involved in good and bad days, the rough and tumble, when things go well, when things are not so well, when we're just feeling like it's another boring humdrum day. Jesus is always there shaping and drawing us to himself because that's what the good shepherd does. Just like the sheep, he's trying to teach us to stay close to him, is to know where the good food is, to know where the nourishment is, where the protection is, where the grace and the mercy are. And any other place really takes us in a totally different path that Jesus never intends. In other words, there is a clear specificity about the involvement of the Good Shepherd in our lives. He's not here to meet our expectations of Him. He's here to change our expectations so that we can see Him as He is. And that's precisely what the Jewish leaders in this story did not understand. They expected Him to be like what they thought. And Jesus has enough courage to say, no, I am. I don't have to become for you. I am the good shepherd. Come and follow me. Allow me to lead you. Allow me to provide for you. Allow me to correct you when necessary. Allow me to teach you. Come under my tutelage. Be my sheep. Because that is, in fact, the place of mercy, the place of forgiveness, the place of guidance, and the place of provision. If you want to live life, in other words, on your own terms, and you want to keep the Good Shepherd at a distance, that's quite possible. You can, as it were, say, I don't want to go that way, and go yours. And while, while Jesus does not like it because he knows you're, you're intentionally at that play, point putting yourself in a place of danger, a place that is less than what it is that he intends for you, he will allow that to happen. He never robs you of your capacity to choose right and wrong. But if you're willing to say to him, Lord, my desire is to follow you, even though I, I know I don't always get it right, and then you have a Messiah who will be that good shepherd in your life, who will shield you, who will lead you, and who will finally take you into the very throne room of heaven, where, as, we, as was just read, finally we will be in that place where there is no pain, where there is no grief, and where God wipes away every tear from every eye. The fulfillment of all that the good shepherd has promised. So in some ways, how do you think about Jesus? Does the Jesus in your head match up with the Jesus in the scriptures or not? Who do you really believe in? The Jesus up here or the Jesus in here? Will you allow him to be who he is? And to be who he is in your life. So that he in fact can be for you the very good shepherd that he desires. Leading, forgiving, <coughs> providing, taking care of, protecting. Fighting on your behalf, correcting you when you stray. Not a passive beatific Jesus but a Jesus who is deeply involved in the circumstances of your life. You have that choice to be independent or to actually be his sheep. That's, in fact, the commitment that you made when you were confirmed. That was the commitment that was made on your behalf if you were baptized as an infant. Yes, I will come under the authority of this good shepherd. I am willing to learn how to trust him. 
That's really the meaning of what's going to be happening later when we confirm and receive two people who are willing to say, by virtue of their actions, I don't want to be outside of his care and authority. I come under his authority. I will be his no matter what. As we act this out, as we make and reaffirm the promises that were made in baptism, in a sense, that's what we're now saying again here. Yes, I belong to him. He is my good shepherd. I am willing to be his sheep. I am willing to come under his authority, to follow him, and to know the joy of his presence, the wonder of his forgiveness, and the very promise of his provision, and the very inheritance of heaven itself when I pass from this life to the next. Family of God, what could be better than that? But if you want to live life on your own terms, you can do that. But if you do, what you're actually doing is saying no to the Messiah, the Son of God, the very one who redeemed you. So please, as we come into this time of commitment, don't just let the liturgy sort of roll over your head. Think about what you're saying. And allow this, these commitments to be yours. Active, baptized members that you are. So that today, it's a celebration. A celebration of new commitments made. But also a celebration of a thought-out commitment. I come under your authority. Be my good Shepherd, carry me and lead me because I would rather be nowhere else than under your authority. Let us pray together. Father, in the midst of the many things that we could give our devotion, our time, our talents, we turn to you. We thank you for your clear invitation to follow you, to be the sheep that you have made us, to come under your authority, and to know you as that good shepherd who leads us, guides us, and brings us safely home. Thank you. We would rather be nowhere else. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.